Well, I guess we can start, yeah? How do I sound back there? Can anybody hear? Okay, this, we have this whole new uh, gizmo with a mic on my shirt and a little box and my, oh, here. So you guys can hear? Okay. Oh no, no. Turn it up a little bit. How do I, how do I? How's that? Higher? He's going to control it from back there, yeah. That's Phil Spector, my producer. Be a teacher and get that last kid at the last row. Yeah, let's see what he's doing. Okay, let's see. How's that? <laughs> Stereo, right? Okay. Well, first, I want to say that um, I'm going to ask for your applause, but it's not for us. It's for yourselves, because I'm a little emotional. I haven't been here for all this time, but this year we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation. So give yourselves a round of applause. Without all your support and continued love, we wouldn't be in this room or standing here doing this. So uh, tonight we're going to cover a history of Winter Garden, specifically because we're the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation. We began right here downtown in the heart of the city. So if I mess something up, Phil Cross, I will be asking you for help. <laughs> He's my go-to guy. So uh, it's been quite a journey for me. I'm here 12 years and have grown to love it even more than I did when I started, you know, 12 years ago. Um, so I'm quite proud to be here with a great staff. We have Will McCoy, our new writer curator. And we have Kate Kester, our social media marketing person. And we have some board members who work over and above what board members usually do, too. So give those board members a, board of, a round of hands, yeah. I forget all their names because I'm forgetting everything. So uh, I just wanted to thank you all for that and for the support. If you have any questions during my presentation, wait till the end if that works because I'll get thrown off and I'll be talking about how Christopher Columbus came over on the Titanic to start the Women's Temperance Unit in 1945. Wrong facts, so yeah. There's going to be about 53, 54 slides, so feel free to leave now if you need to. Think of it, you're in your uncle's basement watching a slideshow of a family outing, which is what this is. It's a family. It's a family history. So that, that's why we're all here, and I will do my best. Okay. In the beginning, before us, we had our Timaqua living along the lake. That is typical of uh, drawings made by French explorers who had heard about these folks living around the lake. And later, followed by the Seminole. Now, I'm not going into a lot of detail about the Seminole because many of you have seen and also know about the exhibit we have at the museum next door. If you haven't seen it, you have to stop in. It is Fabulous. Will did the writing and curating, and it's the Becky Nix collection. Anyone know Becky Nix locally? She's Lakeview High School? Yeah. She has, she has quite a collection of seminal garb, and we decided to build an exhibit about it. So it's in the museum, 11 to 3, Tuesdays through Saturdays. The panels, as well as the costume, well, I shouldn't say costumes, the clothing, tell the story of these folks who were here way before us, before they were moved out. So please stop by and see that. Now we go to when we arrived, 1880s, 1890s through 1929. Some families arrived in the 1860s when it was quiet, mostly Oakland, Tildenville area, a little bit here, but things were still quiet. And settlers arrived here by train, of course. And by 1899, I don't want to trip over the um, ether machine because <laughs> that'll be it. Let me move <laughs> right there. By, the 18, by 1899, we had two major railroad lines coming through the area shipping citrus and vegetables. So you have an original photo of the Orange Belt Depot near, kind of near Woodland and Plant Streets, built about in the 1880s. 
And that predated the 1906 Atlantic Coastline Depot, which was built right next door where the 1923 depot now stands. That was built in 1923, which is now the Winter Garden Heritage Museum. Uh, the Tavares and Gulf Depot was our second. Now, this little village had two train lines that ran like over 100 years shipping produce. We were prosperous. That was right down the street, eventually morphed in 1913 to the Tavares and Gulf Depot, which is now the Central Florida Railroad Museum. Got that right. So if you haven't been to the Railroad Museum lately, just to say you need to check it out. It's been expanded and brightened and, and fluffed up. It's incredible. The guys have done a great job. We love that place. So that's our depots. These are ferrying people now to West Orange County starting in oh, fully 1899. It's getting really busy with the two lines. Now, there's a utility plant. This is so cool. This building here, that's the utility plant that was built in about 1912 for Winter Garden. They got a bunch of guys from Oakland and uh, Tildenville to actually come and consult to help Winter Garden put up a power plant. Oakland, Tildenville had gone up about 1909, I think, to power South Lake Apopka Citrus Growers Association. Yeah, and eventually electrified the surrounding neighborhood. So in 1912, Winter Garden gets its utility and electric plant. Now, a woman locally, I uh, forget her name, but she was in what she called a junk store in the land, and she found a photo album of Winter Garden photographs that we had never seen before. And they have to do with the building of the power plant that came along in 1928. We weren't quite sure of the date, because it could be any date, you know, around this time. So we're looking at these photos close. And that is the power plant that stood up right before the one that was built in the 50s, right? 1953, I think, the later one, something like that. Yeah. Well, that was the last one. That came down in 1953, I think. Yeah. That's the inside generator. So this was fabulous for downtown Winter Garden. This electrified the whole area. It supplied power, water, steam. And we were looking closer at this photo and if you look way in the back, you'll see the south side of the railroad museum. So the depot is right there. And then way in the back, I had to ask um, Will to actually look at this because I couldn't see it. You know. But there's a 1928 calendar on the wall back there. So that dates the photo. So we were so excited. So um, we have a whole series of these photos, including the guy who built the system for Winter Garden. Quite exciting getting finds like this when people show up with scrapbooks or, or photos we get very emotional and all excited we stop everything else we're doing to look at the pictures so by this time 1912 1928 1929 the city is up and running and that's the 1923 acl depot and then it's the 1913 tavares and gulf depot color photos the way they look today they're both museums as you know this actually predates a lot of the downtown development because in 1979, the National Railway Historical Society, Central Florida chapter, purchased the depot. That was way early. That's foresight. And in 1983, they had restored and transformed it into the Central Florida Railroad Museum. So they were here downtown doing history way before a lot of folks. And this is the 80s when not much was happening downtown. And just to show you this great little picture supplied to us by Doug Matthews locally, that is the, um, okay, I gotta reference this. All right, there's South Lake Apopka Citrus Growers Association, the big complex on the corner that's still there that's been repurposed. Oakland Park is over there in the fields now. And this little depot stood right off the curve as you come down Tildenville School Road and make the right past the packing house. That's where that little depot stood. It's what we call a vegetable depot for Tildenville. It wasn't really passenger depot, but if you took the train, you could get off there and just you know, march down the street to your house. Um, we also know someone whose um, grandmother, I believe, saw, um, saw the train stop there and offload, offload lumber and a kit to build a Sears house. You know those Sears Roebuck kit houses? that there's one on Tildenville School Road near the post office, that blue house. That's apparently a Sears Roebuck model house that you just put together by ordering parts. And somebody remembers seeing that being offloaded and then taken by wagon down the street. That's pretty cool. 
So that's a Tilden building. We're all about railroads. And that's the interior of the South Lake Apopka Citrus Growers Association packing house about 1909. Families put, you know, families got together and did what they could. These are um, sorting and packing fruit for shipping out on the train. That's the 1909 building was uh, added to in later years to the size that you see now. And that is, um, this is great, the vegetable fields north of Plant Street. I mean, you had the train tracks, you had commerce, you had houses two or three blocks, and then you had groves and fields, a lot of vegetable fields. And we'll have um, new folks come in and they'll tell us where their new house is that they just bought or, you know, whatever. And um, we'll say, well, where's your new house? And they'll say, oh, North Highland in the golf cart district. We say the golf cart district. Then they'll tell me the street. Then I say, oh, Cabbage Patch. I say, Cabbage Patch? They're from Ohio. What do they know from Cabbage Patches? So that's a little bit of history that we like to share with new residents. So we were all about vegetables and produce. We're steaming through the early 20th century. This is a picture of Plant and Main Streets, circa 1907. Okay, now, you know where Three Birds Cafe is? It's right there on that corner, that two-story skyscraper. And um, what's that restaurant right next door? Moon Cricket Grill is right about there. And then you have Main Street going south, and that's where um, Ms. B's candy store stood, which is now Gator Lilies, I believe. So this references you. You're right there on the heart of downtown. There were tracks, but they're off, off sides. Streets were dirt. We didn't get brick streets until much later. We have 1915, this building stood, this is a newer picture than we've had in the past. This is the southwest corner of Plant and Boyd, where, uh, Plant and Boyd, where Carrie Fl the Fleck building is, the yellow kind of bank looking building. That was A.B. Newton's second store. His first store was a little bit south of Plant, closer to his house. And that's the house they built in 1905. That's A.B. Newton's house, who was our first mayor. And that stands at the southeast corner of Smith and Highland. Y'all know that house, that big old white house. Yeah, it's beautiful. And we call A.B. Newton Mr. First. He was the first mayor, the first postman, the first newspaper publisher. He did a lot of things first. He also served in the legislature. If something needed doing, he did it. And what else about him? Yeah, he was elected mayor in 1908. 1908. And you'll notice a lot of these structures in town celebrate our 100th anniversary in 1903, 2003. So we were a few years off when we had the big centennial for downtown. But that's okay. I talked to a couple of people who said, well, you know, we started thinking about the 100th birthday. And, you know, so we just decided to go with it. Downtown was ready. The streetscape was in. The shops were getting full. The bike trail was in. Let's just be 100. So that's nice. So now we say established in 1903, and what's the other word? Incorporated, Incorporated 1908. So that works. Makes everybody happy. <laughs> this is um, the third incarnation of his store, the southwest corner of Plant in Maine. Again, today's Three Birds. We have an, uh, and you'll notice the um, Pullman train car in the background of that picture. That's on the Tavares and Gulf line. Um, those are two plates that celebrated the. Um, 1917, the 17th anniversary of A.B. Newton's stores in Winter Garden. They gave away these souvenir plates. Now, 17 is kind of an unusual, you know, anniversary to celebrate, but that's what it is. So we're figuring they were made in about, <clears throat> oh, I got to do my math. He came to the area about 1892 and started getting involved in commerce right away, about 1892, 1893. So 17 years after 1893 is about when those plates were produced. You could also tell by the style of dress and the woman. It's not the 20s or the teens. It's, it's very late 1890s. And I love the um, oxen crossing the railroad tracks. They're heading towards, probably heading towards the um, depot, which is just about on this corner. Now, hotels. We had a lot of hotels at this, in this intersection. We had, um, and people were coming to buy citrus buy fruit, uh, vegetables. They were um, just coming to town to visit. They were staying and fishing at the Edgewater Hotel in the beginning of the 1900s. So we have hotels and rooming houses going up in the vicinity. 
the 1890 Orange Hotel was on South Main, burned in 1912, about the vicinity of where um, Doxology is, that block near the tracks. Uh, the Shelby Hotel, which is now Tony's package store, right on the corner, that was built in 1913. It's gone through a few incarnations. It's now Tony's. But that was the first big hotel in town, two stories, that was built by Mr. Dillard, who we'll talk about. The street is named for him. We also had the Bell House down, down uh, just behind Tony's, a couple of lots north of Tony's was Bell House. Now, I always like to tell the story that um, I think when they built Rod Reeves' house, they used some of the doors from Bell House, so Rod Reeves' bedroom door had a number on it <laughs> from the hotel. <laughs> we'll, start, we'll keep it right there at that page, yeah. So uh, these you know, supplied lodging to travelers and businessmen. And then the town is growing. You know, we're talking about the teens. So we're heading towards, um, yeah, when we mentioned Dillard, he was a builder, a grower, and a photographer. Not many towns this size have so many photos talking about the first decades of, this you know, of the previous century, thanks to Dillard. He um, built the Dillard and Boyd building at, that's Three Birds now, that still stands. And he donated land for First Baptist. First Baptist actually was established in Ocoee originally. And he was Baptist. And, you know, when you want to go to services on Sunday, if you're living in Winter Garden, you don't want to drive to Ocoee. It's three miles away by car. So he talked to the congregation and the pastor, I guess, and said, I'll offer you $250 and a piece of property if you move your First Baptist congregation and seated in Winter Garden. They says, okay. <laughs> they came to town. And the first church was actually across the street where Jimmy's Thriftway used to be, across from the church. Then it moved to the side, uh, the side street here, west side, I believe. And then eventually in 1922, this went up. That's a beautiful building. Have y'all ever been inside, like the top, the roof, the bell, ta the bell room and all that? It's incredible. And he also built, and we don't have great pictures of this. This is the Man and Mills Dry Goods Store which eventually became the Gem Theater. That's the building down South Main with the tube and the marquee. That was a theater for a while. And now it's full of little shops. And the guy who actually built this theater also built the um, Garden Theater, the Annex Theater on the east side of town for African-American audiences, and the drive-in. He, he was in charge of the drive-in also, I think, yeah. Star yeah, the Starlight, exactly. So um, they say he was kind of tight with the bucks, so he didn't put marquees with theater names. You just knew that was the Garden Theater, that was the Annex, and that was the gem down the street. That was Dillard. Now, we're like in the teens, early 20s, Florida starting to be marketed as a place to really move to. A lot of us are here because of postcards like that. Um, they drew a lot of people. Pennsylvania Railroad was big in getting people to Florida. And they're also marketing Lake Apopka as a place to play and camp and fish for largemouth bass. We became the largemouth bass capital of the world. And people are suddenly flocking to the Winter Garden area. This is the 20s going towards the Depression. People have bucks. So they're coming to Winter Garden. And they need a new hotel. So guess what they build? The Edgewater. Yep, there's, a, there's construction about 1926. That's when it... Uh, it's probably the 1930s, late 1930s, and someone is always placing a yardstick next to the wonderful bass that you can catch in Lake Apopka. So this was marketed, and we had people from all over the world coming to town to fish those bass. Um, the hotel started about 1924, I think I'm told, 24, 25. Then there was a real estate crash, and it kind of was put on hold. But we had... Um, businesses across the street from the hotel who watched this hotel just sit there and people would say to them, what's the matter with this town? You can't finish your hotel. So they solicited funds from donors and investors and eventually 1927 that hotel was completed and built as a state-of-the-art hotel. It has uh, three stories and the elevator still works. It's one of those lever elevators. It has a sprinkler system for Every room, there's piping, so this, this was a special place to go to, and people flock there. We also had something else happen in the 20s in the area, big. See, it's always like, okay, you think tractors, hotels, but these left such a mark on the community, especially this guy, 
Hoyle Pounds was an Okoe businessman. He had a, a repair shop over there, garage. He did uh, tractor equipment, farming equipment. Eventually, he came to Winter Garden, a couple of buildings, and he finally, in 1926, built that at the corner of Lakeview and Plant. You know that building. It's where Burkett Engineering is currently on the first floor. And this guy also, um, a couple of years later, he was being asked by people locally to um, do something about the metal tractor tires that were destroying all the brick streets in town, tearing up the new brick streets that went up in 1922 mostly. And they said, you know, do something with these tractors. They're, they're ancient. They're destroying our beautiful brick streets. So he said, okay, let me think about this. He was an inventor as well, an entrepreneur. So he mashed together a couple of deflated truck tires as an experiment around a rim and inflated them. It was a lot of hard work. And eventually he had these tractors on balloon tires that worked much better on the brick streets, didn't destroy them, and also were better in the sandy orange groves. Then he refined his rim, he patented it in 1928, and he was off and running. This guy um, sold to, he became the biggest case tractor dealer east of the Mississippi River, Little Winter Garden. He employed a lot of people, kept coming up with innovative things for farming equipment. It's like that's a giant air sprayer that he, you know, just improved and marketed. We have so many photos just like that. Equipment that you never see, but if you're working in the groves or, or you're just a, a grove owner or you're just a worker for them, you know what all that stuff means. A lot of us, we just don't, but they kept things going and growing. Okay, so things are great till about 1929, Winter Garden's enjoying its golden age, first one, and then along comes the Great Depression. So ironically, <clears throat> oh, let me go back one. We're not doing so badly here because we have to grow food. People got to eat. So we're mostly agricultural. We're feeding people. We're shipping citrus and vegetables. It's not too bad, and we get even better, as I'll explain. This, um, the Garden Theater down the street went up in 1935. I think in the middle of the Depression, they're building a theater. People had to do something, and it was not expensive. They're going to the movies. So this replaced a theater that burned right next door in 1934, what we call the Garden Theater One. And it looked like, if you see the facade of Pilar's, that kind of mimics what the Garden Theater One looked like with that archway, with the cutouts. So we have a couple of distant photos of that first theater. So that burned, and we have photos of the wreckage of that, the wreckage of that theater. There are just chairs all over the place, and just, it's terrible what happened. The whole thing burned down. And this went up less than a year later. The Garden Theater debuted in 1935. So that was something to do in the Depression. And we love this picture that we just saw recently. It's Robert Tilden of the Tilden family, Tildenville, which is now part of Winter Garden. And that's his cucumber field off of Highway 545. There is, um, yeah, there's a house on... Joe Williams' house on Oakland Avenue that unfortunately just sustained some damage from the hurricane. He's the guy with the fire truck and all the Christmas decorations or Halloween decorations. I've been told that that house, is, that house was built with cucumber money because in the great freeze of 1894, 1895, a lot of people left the area, just abandoned their property. But he, uh, Tilden's bought what they could and just grew vegetables for the time they waited for their newly planted orange groves to come back to fruition. So that big house that you see was built with cucumber money, as I've been told. George Walker also, he was our depression mayor for about 10 terms, nine or 10 terms. Uh, they were voted for one year terms in those days. So. Uh, we had a mayor before him who um, wasn't doing such a great job, they say. I I'm sorry if anyone's related to him. I'm just, you know, just stating history. But at one point, Winter Garden couldn't afford to pay the electric bill for the streetlights, so it was dark downtown. So he was a successful businessman on Plant Street. He had Walker Electric. He sold appliances, etc. And they said to him, you know, you're a good businessman. Why don't, you, why don't you run for mayor? And he was like, no, no thanks. I'm busy. So they asked him and he finally conceded, yeah, I'll, I'll be mayor. And he kind of enjoyed it because once he realized that um, as mayor, you could be the front man for applying for federal funds from the WPA under Franklin Roosevelt in the 30s, suddenly money is flowing into Winter Garden to build civil projects. 
It's a little guy. So he kept doing it one year, two years, three years. So all through the 1930s, he got all these wonderful things built. Trailer City, which, as you can see, was temporary parking for trailers that came from all over the country to fish in Lake Apopka. That was a big draw. And there were still people with money. And they're driving down south, down to Winter Garden, parking in Trailer City for a few months and enjoying the lake, which was all improved. The lakefront was all improved. They had uh, yacht basins, what they call yacht basins. Those are those two pools that those big, uh, that you see um, down by the, um, just past the pool where those little bridges are. All that went up in the 1930s. And now, of course, Trailer City is permanent. I love that place. City Hall was built in 1937 in the vicinity of today's police station post office, right on that stretch of block, I believe. And that lasted until they built the new one in 2008. He also built the, uh, had, well, I'm saying he built. He applied for funding, $250,000 from the feds built all of the things we're talking about. That's like four or five million dollars in today's money, I think. Could be more. But there's the fire station that went up in 1938, I think. It is now the Winter Garden Art Association. That's Hoyle Pounds. He was fire chief for 41 years. He also built Walker Field. He finished, he completed the um, construction of the improvements to the football and baseball fields on Park Avenue. And he also put up the auditorium and rec center, what we call Tanner Hall today. That's where Lakeview High School used to, I think, play basketball games, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. And there's Little Hall, which was like a smaller rec center. That building is still there. These are all still used. And then that, that's a picture of when those, those giant palms were still lining the main walk to the dock, down, um, down to the water, the fishing dock. The place was beautiful. There was a fish pool, and of course, there was a swimming pool. That place was amazing. All of these things he got for $250,000. We also have in the 1930s, because things weren't so great down here, African-American kids were not being educated as they deserved to be. So William and Juanita Maxey, college graduates up in Jacksonville, they say, you know, there's a need in Winter Garden. We're going to go and teach the kids. And we're going to bring them up. So they did. They came to town, discovered the little, discovered that all they had for the African-American kids on the east side was a little Rosenwald school. Those were built by families to educate Afri African-American kids. So they took, eventually, they, they it, this moved that school to a bigger lot. It took 10 years, 12, 15 years. They hired more teachers, had more grades added, because they weren't getting a lot of help from the Board of Ed, Orange County. Eventually, by the 1950s, we had Drew High School for African-American kids. And that, I think, graduated 10 or 11 classes before integration and that's where Westside Tech is out on Story Road now. That's the south entrance to the plant. So that's where Drew High School was. And there's a group of the first teachers. You can see Mrs. Maxey, and that is uh, William Maxey. She, they're also in the picture right above. And they would raise funds for expansion and hiring by doing things like selling fish sandwiches or peanuts to local people. So this was the Depression, so every little bit helped. So they're kind of local heroes. That is the Maxi Community Center, which began, named for them, that began life as the Annex Theater, which was built by the same gentleman who built the other theaters. This was for African-American patrons. Before that, they sat in the balcony of the Garden Theater. There was a separate entrance for African-American families. So that was the, that is now the Maxi Community Center out on Klondike. World War II comes around. Depression is ironically over thanks to, you know, war efforts, war building. Now, what are we doing here? We're not building machinery or tanks or battleships. We're not training troops in Winter Garden. We're bivouacking some during the war. But what we do is supply healthy citrus juices. The marketing guys were phenomenal in this area. Anything to do with citrus? Well, yeah, the state. We supplied troops, provided training in milita at military installations, such as naval and air force bases. That's the one in Key West. But our big thing here in this area, our big contribution was juice, healthy canned juice that we shipped by the hundreds of thousands of cans to Europe and Asia to help our troops, to keep them healthy. Because there was still that thought in those days that um, if you're a pirate on a, an old wooden pirate ship, you're going to catch scurvy when your food goes bad. So you need, you need vitamin C to ward off scurvy. So here in Winter Garden, 
we've got vitamin C by the truckload. So we did very well selling that canned juice to the military. Anybody who wanted to work in those days could get a job in citrus. Here is one of our other local heroes, George McMillan. He was a flying tiger, flew secret missions for the Chinese Air Force, and came home after successful runs against Imperial Japan. Uh, they welcomed him back to town as a hometown hero, gave him a, a watch at the Garden Theater, celebration, they celebrated him. And then I'm told, uh, uh, you know, sometimes it's not written down, but I'm told by some of the older families, he got a little bored just hanging around town, so he re-enlisted directly to the American Air Force, which was, was called by then, and he continued missions over Asia. He wanted to keep fighting for his country. And unfortunately, he was shot down over the Triangle, Burma, Thailand, over there, and um, we lost him. And we have in our possession probably our most exciting archive, archived item. We have his Chinese-issued Flying Tiger uniform top, which you just don't see. We're very proud to have that. This was donated to us by the family, so we keep good care of it in the cold archive down the hall. And that was one of the planes the Flying Tigers flew. We also had Joe Johnson. He served in World War II. Again, they weren't, because of segregation, even in the Army, they weren't allowed to achieve the same levels of promotional activity, say, as their you know, white counterparts. But they worked hard. Joe Johnson worked hard. He also sends a lot of money home. His wife, Mary, they lived in uh, on the east side, off of Hennis Road, I believe. There's, this, there's an area there that we call the Johnson Tract or Johnson Settlement. But they built houses. Say again? Someone? Yes, 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 exactly. Railroad Avenue. They built houses for, um, you know, to offer shelter to underbridge, underprivileged families at reduced rates. And as one of the great grandchildren said to me, sometimes, sometimes they didn't even charge people; they just gave them a place to live, which was nice. And a lot of those houses still survive over there. And Chloe Johnson is related to that. I think she's the great granddaughter. She's now one of our city commissioners. Chloe's great. Say again. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, say again. Joe Johnson? Joe Johnson. It breaks down the grid at the bottom. There you go. There you go. See? Did a lot. They said he was just a quiet guy, just did for his family and his community, no matter who it was. You're right. This is typical of how they promoted victory vitamin C during the war. Housewives, well, just to say it was different times, housewives saw ads like that, they ran to the store to buy grapefruit juice or orange juice. We did well. And it was canned. Now keep that in, you got those ads? Yeah. Now keep that in mind, it's canned juice. That's what we had at the time. Didn't taste that great, right? They did fresh fruit. So what happens through the 50s and the 80s? So the war is over. We realize we want better things now. We've made money during the war. We've had a taste of prosperity. We've also had a taste of canned orange juice, which is not that great. A taste of the can, but that's what we had. So scientists got together with Winter Garden guys, at least locally, and came up with ways to sweeten the pulp, sweeten the juice. So that eventually led to better canned orange juice. This is the late 40s, early 50s, and then they come up with an idea called concentrate. And that made everybody crazy because it was like drinking liquid gold sugar. <laughs> now they really promoted this in this area. This area became planted with even more groves. Everything was going, most everything was going to the um, juice plant here to be made into concentrate because they had cooler rooms. People loved it. You could sell it anywhere and you could also store it year round so now the juice plant is 24 7. i remember when um i was a kid if we wanted orange juice you had to you know you had to you had to go to the store and buy um no no wrong wrong or wrong we got orange juice as concentrate and it was a big deal because if we want an orange juice in the morning mom would have to remember to take the can out of the freezer the night before put it on the kitchen counter <laughs> The next morning, you kind of gloop it into the pitcher and take the end of the wooden spoon and go like this. 
That's when you forgot to defrost it. So you're going like this. Add water, stir it around, and about three days later, you have a glass of orange juice. But it tasted so good. It tasted so good. Yep. So now this place is just percolating. We are nothing but juice in the 50s, early 60s. This is like the juice capital of the world, I guess you can say. And giant packing houses line Plant Street and, and the, the highways all the way from Killarney, all the way out to Okoe, up to Apopka. There's giant packing houses all over, about a dozen of them that we have good histories on. So they're all busy, they're all working. And to market this fruit, now y'all know about citrus crate labels, of course. The more colorful they were in the dim packing houses up north where they um, auctioned off, you know, Winter Garden Juice in like Chicago and New York, the more colorful the label was, the more apt it was to catch somebody's eye, a buyer's eye. So they're doing that. Some of them are so beautiful. We don't even know who the designers were. These were just anonymous artists in the packing houses or, you know, graphics companies working with them. So these are particularly beautiful. The Winter Garden Citrus Growers Association, that's over on 3rd Street, which is now Florida Paints. That's the second building they had over there. That's a metal building. Um, that's from Avalon down south. You've got Billy Bob. Those are the two sons of one of the Bataglias who had a giant packing house also on Plant Street, which started off as, it became Keen, I think. Keen brother. That's right, already Keen it became, yep. And that, of course, is Grace Mathersmith, who decided, you know, I'm going to have boxes of oranges. I'm going to sell my oranges. My husband's passed. It's the early 1940s. I want to make a little money. She didn't have to, but it's kind of what I've been told is a vanity label. It's kind of small, but she had crates of fruit made, and she would send them to friends, and she sold some. But mostly, um, mostly she did it because she wanted to. And she said, well, you know, I need someone on the label. How about me? This is Grace Mather. Yep. It's Grace from Oakland. So she went up to New York and had that dress designed, wore it, got herself photographed, put herself on the label, and went to town. There's also, we probably, well, I don't know, this might be too detailed, maybe, or, but anyway, there's a code to these labels that if you're a buyer, you should know what the colors, the main colors on these labels mean. Anything that there's a lot of blue in, that's your top grade fruit. Anything that's mostly red, there's a lot of red in it, that's medium grade. You could drink it, you could juice it, but, you know, it's not high super quality. Depends on the season sometimes and the temperature and the weather and how sweet it is. And then if a label is mostly yellow or light green, you don't see too much of those from this area. That's not the best fruit. That's what we'd call maybe third grade. So you kind of have to know the unspoken code, but, you know. And that is a fabulous picture of the Edgewater in the 1950s with a train just parked right in front of it. We love this photo. Yeah, we all, there's also uh, some people with, um, took me a while, but there's a Charles Chips truck delivering next to the hotel. So downtown in the 50s, is, there's trains, there's the hotel. Yes, sir? That train right there, um, we lived in Montford back in the 50s. That train would come by, by right our house. My brother, he, like I see him right now, in his khaki pants, white t-shirt, one of those engineer hats, or whatever. and he had run down there, and they'd stop, pick him up right there, and take him to Tavares. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, no, age nine or ten. Oh, that must have been so thrilling. Wow. Damn, we got new bicycles. Well, we kept running back, and, and we didn't have bicycles, and he missed the train, and that didn't go over. <laughs> 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 that was, uh, <laughs> he rode one of those guys. Wow. Yep, so we're like enjoying a second golden age by the late 50s. It's the 50s. Most of the country is or thinks we are. It's things in the background that are about to occur. <clears throat> So, downtown Winter Garden, typical, people waiting for a parade and a parade. This is, um, this is coming, of course, east along Plant Street. You can see the Garden Theater there. There are two buildings that are no longer there, or that, 
but that's where those Roper, the two Roper buildings are, where the uh, er, plant, uh, Urban on Plant and Axum are, right in that little area. And I can't see, but people say that's a guy sticking his head out of the top window of the Garden Theater, watching the parade. Yeah, we love that picture. So downtown was, this was small town America at its peak. Fishing camps, there were at one point 24 of them around Lake Apopka, busy all year round. People just, like I say, the largemouth bass and anything else you can get out of that lake. It was still cold, clear, and clean. It was a draw for people all over the world. So think of that, 24 of those around the lake. Some more elaborate than others, and if you know where to look, you'll see remnants of the fishing camps that are now small houses where people live in. It's pretty cool. And then we have, of course, now we're in that those decades I was talking about, the 50s through the 80s. Now we're heading towards maybe the early to mid 60s. Things are starting to change locally. It's hard to pinpoint an exact date because there was a slow demise for our poor lake. But in the 1940s, as you all probably know, they drained about 40,000 acres of land on the North Shore to plant vegetables for the war effort. So they drained the marshes, built a dike where that little wiggly water is between the green and the orange, and planted. So the water was free. They could irrigate by just opening those gates and pumping the water onto the fields, letting the water sit. And of course, you're fertilizing your trees and plants and you're throwing pesticides on. So all these great chemicals from the 40s and 50s. Wow, look at us, we're so prosperous. The fields are stretching for miles. The photos that we see, it's just, just vegetables into the distance, into the horizon. And then they'd pump that water back into the lake and close the gates. Well, slowly, 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 those chemicals built up and we got a reverse ecosystem. Bad plants started to grow, bad fish started to thrive, and all the good stuff started to die, slowly but surely. Mm, right? Eventually, also, algae blooms, which um, just grew off the fertilizer, just covered the, the top of the lake. It was like a piece of green saran wrap. So there's no sunlight or fresh water from rain, you know, nourishing the lake. It's just dying. It's suffocating. So that that is, um, I think that's the early 1960s, mid 1960s. Is that me? No. Oh, okay. That's cool. That's all right. Now this is if you if you go kayak kayaking around the lake. I don't. Has anyone been around the lake like on kayak? Yeah, you'll see remnants of some of the fish camps, the 24 fish camps just offshore, just they all closed. There's not any of the originals thriving anymore, but that's what happened. There were no fish to catch. There was no reason to go to the lake. So we all kind of, you know, you turn your back on a lake that's not doing anything for you anymore. You know, you don't know how to fix it. It's broken. And the other thing that happened in the area in the 60s was the decline of Winter Gardens Commercial District started quietly, but um, World War II, we were, of course, attacked at Pearl Harbor. That was a surprise attack. So President Eisenhower, by the 1950s, during the prosperous decade, said, you know, if we're ever, we need to be ready in case we're ever attacked. We need to have super highways across the country to get our troops to the west, to the east. So the interstate highways were born. And those are actually, I mean, they look squiggly on the maps, but there's a lot of straightaways. Planes can land on them and also be treated as runways. You can also treat the interstates as runways. So they're built, they were built mainly for defense, not just so that we could get to Walmart. <laughs> so the country is getting covered by beautiful interstates. They're attracting new subdivisions. Population's growing, so people are building near the roads which give access to all these new neighborhoods. And what happens to all the small towns that are on the US highways and the state highways? They start to kind of, you know, wither and die. Quietly, economy is not so great up there anymore by the mid, late 60s, early 70s. That is um, the Battaglia packing house that was on the east end of Plant Street, right where the library is right here now. You could probably have seen that tank just a few years ago. But that, that's closed, that wasn't used anymore. We had a lot of downtown shops that were just empty and people are telling me people just you know parked wherever. There wasn't much commerce after a while. And that's just another picture of what the area looked like by the uh, water tower. Nothing special, just empty space for people to park. There wasn't, it wasn't a, a bright commercial district anymore. There were some shops but it just wasn't what it was in the 50s and early 60s. 
And people tell me that and they're like, they missed all that, you know, to have lived through the 40s and 50s and then suddenly see it in the 60s. People said it was so sad and, you know, people were living here. People didn't leave just because of that. So they had to see this in person. And that's a typical abandoned little storefront. There are apartments upstairs maybe, but the owners used a lot of those stores along plant and the side streets as storage because they had businesses that they built on Highway 50 near the big parking lots and the, the movie plexes and all that. The thing is, um, you're a businessman. You're trying to keep your business going. You're going to have to spend a lot of money at your abandoned shop tearing it down or improving it. You're just not going to spend the money. So our architecture and real estate stayed put night about 90 percent 95 percent it just went to sleep which i mean look at us now that's typical of what happened uh, that's a later picture but that's typical of what happened um when highway we didn't have an interstate come through but we had highway 50 and that attracted parking lots and businesses and people are people you want to shop in new places you need room to park the population is growing florida's warm people are flocking here we're not just about citrus we're about theme parks then it's people in all kinds of businesses they need places to live they need schools churches hospitals so downtown winter garden kind of goes to sleep tri-city. yeah 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 tri-city yep this was um, this stood on the corner of took me a while to figure it out, but we put our heads together. State Road 50 in Dillard was the business district sign that pointed down Dillard to the plant. And it wasn't doing um, much good. There wasn't much to see on Plant Street, not much shopping. So um, it was given to um, a Mr. John Laurie, who had that packing house, which was the former Roper packing, fertilizer packing house in Brayton, at Brayton Road, which is now where uh, that guy, I can't think of his name, Stefan somebody, he has that multimedia production place. He does a big Halloween thing. It's in the same building. Yeah, but he um, took on the sign. So it's pointing to the business district, which just didn't really exist at this point. And I think it's now, from what I'm told, it's in a city warehouse. I would love to see that back up again on one of the side streets, or at least on 50, and why not? It used to be orange and green, too. At one point, it was painted orange and green. And the third thing that happened, this affected almost everybody in the area, was the demise of the citrus industry. The little graph shows the tens of thousands of acres devoted to citrus planting starting in about the 1880s. So you can see us go up and up and up until... 1894, 1895 was that great killer freeze that just wiped out a lot of growers and people just left the area. People started, and this is what I was talking about, like the Tildens and the Hurleys, they're planting vegetables as they're waiting for their trees to grow again. They're new, not grow again, but you know, new plantings because you can't, once your tree dies, that's it. So they're selling vegetables, a lot of cucumbers. And then the weather, the decades are staying pretty warm in the winters. So you see the 20s and 30s go up. We're planting for the war effort in the 40s, the 50s, all the way through the 60s. We're all about citrus. The whole region is carpeted by citrus. And then things start to change in about 1972. It's not drastic, but maybe third, fourth generation citrus families. Some of the younger people don't want to grow citrus, so they're selling property to, to whom? Who arrived here in 1972, officially? There you go. So now acreage is being sold off, but we're still all about churches until the 1980s. And then you see the graph just plummet to well below 20,000, eventually eventually 10,000 acres devoted to citrus in all of Orange County by about 2005. Three killer freezes in the 1980s, which I'm sure I don't have to tell folks, some of the folks here, what that was like. It was, uh, I think, 1983, 1985, and then 1989. And that was the worst one, I think, 1989. So you have um, all kinds of ways to maybe keep your trees viable overnight. They would spray them with water. The water would freeze, hoping that it would keep the heat inside the oranges, or inside the branches, inside the trees. But if you have nights of 19 degrees, three, four, that's it. Those trees are gone. Three times that happened. A lot of people just gave up and said, okay, 
we want to grow citrus like we did, we're going to move further south in the state where it's a little bit warmer. And that's what happened. So we had a dead lake, downtown was kind of dried up, and then we lost the citrus industry. West Orange County, led by Winter Garden, just kind of went to sleep. There's pictures of the killer freezes, just, yeah, just, yeah. And that's from the spray water. And we also had, uh, it's hard to be an orange tree in Florida. You know, it's not native. So you've got all kinds of challenges. You have um, today the citrus greening spread by the psyllid fly, who just, just the leaves go. They turn, you see a citrus grove full of yellow leaves? That's that guy. And there's also citrus canker caused by a bacteria. And this is what happens to your fruit. It's really tough, like I say, to be an orange tree now in Florida. But for decades and decades, we did it. Things just changed. Nature changed us. This is um, the southwest of the Windermere Lakes region in 1999. This is from Google Earth. You will see Lake Butler, Lake Tibet, and you see a lot of groves. There's some plant, there's, there's some subdivisions, there are some houses going up, but it's mostly rural agricultural. And this is 2024. See the difference? My friend Will points out that his house is, well, yeah, right in this area someplace. We got to live somewhere, right? People are selling a property. It happens. It's a different economy. It's not agricultural, and there's no real fault. People own the property. They can sell it, and if they can't plant citrus, you're going to take care of your heirs, you know? So things, the whole landscape has changed by now. We also had um, good things are happening in the area from the well the 80s through the 90s. We um, elected Mildred Dixon as city commissioner. She served for eight years, then also from 2003 to 2006. She was the first. She was the city's first African American commissioner, and I believe the first female commissioner as well. So she's 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 marked. And then okay, so. Just to review, we have no citrus industry. Downtown Winter Garden is kind of still asleep. We don't have the lake. What are we going to do? Disney's down the road. They came with a lot of promises. Eh, you know, still Winter Garden. We're not that close to Disney. So what do we do? A handful, not tons of people, but they learned quick. A handful of families said, you know, we have this architecture. We have an old theater. We have a hotel. We can do something with this town. We could turn it into a draw. Let's see what happens. So things start to slowly get put into place. 1991, now this is right after the 80s freezes have devastated the area. 1991, Main Street Winter Garden, which is like it, it's federal funding, is established in order to raise funding for plant street improvements. So they're bricking areas, they're planting trees, they're doing a little bit of landscaping. It's starting to look good. Still kind of quiet, though. Again, these things take time to start because you need a lot of support. 1992, a community development, redevelopment agency is established, which means now the city is more heavily involved in improving their downtown and getting more people involved. 1994 is the birth of the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation, which was an offshoot of Main Street Winter Garden. These are people who got together to say, OK, um, we promote history. We save our architecture what we can. We can, we can do this. We can make this place viable again. And in 1996, the downtown commercial and residential historic districts are established and placed on the National Register. Those are marked neighborhoods. They're not like protected neighborhoods. You can still do what you want with your property. It's, you know, free enterprise. So um, that could change. You never know. You want sometimes a, a building that's now 125 years old to stay the way it looks. Or if you've bought a house that was built in 1912, you kind of want that house, we want it to stand. You know what I'm saying? So you would hope that people who buy those houses keep them and build upon them and, and just improve them. That's the hope and the dream. Could happen. Um, 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 um. Also, the bike trail, well, yeah, I think that's next, I'm getting ahead. Yeah, this was our first project here when we uh, started the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation. It was basically set up to rescue the um, Edgewater Hotel from demolition. 
There were some folks who basically didn't care about the hotel, let's tear it down, we'll have room for parking, is what I'm told. And other people would say, well, there's no reason to park in downtown Winter Garden. There's nothing really to shop at. So why don't we save the hotel? So it was, it, yeah, demolition was stopped. And then we were able to, um, investor, investor families, I think, bought it over. Right, Ward, I think? Two or three investor groups bought the hotel. Yeah, and said, okay, We'll bring it up. And that was in about 1998. I think by 2000, 2001, it was, it was a bed and breakfast up and running. So that is on the trail. Garden Theater was our second project. We restored it starting in 2003. It was completed five years later as a performing arts center, a gem on the west side of downtown Plant Street. Now, I know we've all heard the news and the things lately. We're just, we're hoping for the best. And I just want to pledge that the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation is going to be behind any re-restoration of the Garden Theater as a viable community theater with a lot of offerings. So we are, we are poised to just, just help them. We want to promote this new revival. So we're there. We're offering our assistance. Thank you. We'll all do our best. And it's not just going to be us. It's going to be there's a lot more people in town and there's a lot more people that love that theater. So I see good things. The city's not just going to let it go. We don't need a shoe store, right? <laughs> so we love that place and just love conquers all. So 1994, the bike trail comes through and that just starts opening people's eyes to what they could do to downtown Winter Garden. A lot of people bought the little abandoned shops, opened up new restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, boutiques. And now people are coming downtown in a big way. Upwards of over a million people a year now bike, walk, and what else? What do they do? There you go, yeah, down through the, the heart of the historic district. It's a big draw. This is like internationally known. We have people from all over the world who visit our facilities, our two museums and visitor center, and they all know about the West Orange Trail. That is a um, little Christmas image. This did not look like that in 1985 or 1989. I mean, it, it's, it's beautiful. People say, oh, it's just like Mayberry. Oh, I think it's better. I think it's better than, because it's, it's in color. Mayberry was black and white. <laughs> Farmer's Market, internationally known. We have the uh, craft beer with the Pine Street Market down at the West End, like another another notch in the belt. Um, there's the barber shop. We have so many people tell us, my gosh, you have a barber shop on your main street with one of those little poles that goes around. I mean, who does, right? That's great. So it's alive and thriving. And these are the three facilities, like I showed at the beginning. The restored um, 1913 Tavares and Gulf Depot, now the wonderful Central Florida Railroad Museum. That's the Winter Garden Heritage Museum. And that is the building that you all helped put up in 2015. That is this building right here. That is the um, Winter Garden Heritage Foundation History Research and Education Center slash affiliated with Healthy West Orange. Uh, what's it called? The Healthy West Orange Heritage and Cultural Center slash the home of the Winter Garden Heritage Town. Anyway, we're all here. A lot of people involved, which means a lot of help. You know, that, that just proves there's a lot of people that wanted to help us out. And there's our baby caboose. It's air conditioned if you ever want to just stop in the middle of the day. That's our fabulous red fire truck. We also have a, uh, and this is a riot, we have a webcam that runs 20, who's seen the webcam outside the museum? <laughs> Who watches it like a few minutes a day? It's, yeah, you've probably seen Amy and I, you know, doing stupid faces in front of the camera, right? Yeah, I gotcha. So yeah, it's uh, these are what we call kit magnets. And almost the end of our story, um, Lake Apopka wasn't allowed to just continue to death and, and, and then be filled in. It's not a deep lake, so there were lots of thoughts. What to do with this lake? What's, what to do with the land under the lake? What can they do? Well, this guy says, nothing doing. He formed an organization called Friends of Lake Apopka, and he also said, like, you know, join that if you haven't. And he started fundraising and fighting with the state, the county, this one, that one, property owners, farm owners, to restore the lake, to clean up that lake. 
because it's like our, we always say when we talk to the kids in field trips that the Native Americans lived around the lake because it was, it was a battery that charged their lives. It sustained their lives. They fished, they hunted. Then that battery got discharged in the 60s and now it's being recharged again. Like with one of those little, you know, things for your phone that you can never find when you need it. That's me. But yeah, that lake is coming back thanks to major efforts by Jim Thomas and the Friends of Lake Apopka. And the way they've done it, and it's taken a long time, they have, um, the state has uh, purchased all of the farmlands north of the lake. There's no more farming in the lake. You know, there's no more. Now, I got to also say, when people talk about the demise of Lake Apopka, they say the farmers, the farmers, the farmers. It wasn't just the farmers. There were farmers on the north, sure. But on the south, we had Winter, winter Gardens um, uh, sewage plant. We had a uh, citrus processing plant in Oakland. We had a chemical fertilizer plant in Montverde. Plus, we had downwash off, the, off of all the streets surrounding, in the little villages surrounding the lake. It wasn't just the farmers. A lot of, a lot of um, bad things happened to that lake and conspired to basically do what we saw earlier. And the way they're cleaning it up, it's a slow process, but it's a lot better than it used to be. They are fishing out all the gizzard shad. That's, you know, garfish, junk fish. And this, they do like, they fished out millions of those fish out of that lake. I don't know where they all come from, but they're still doing that. They've planted marsh grasses, which help filter the water and also feed the good fish when they reseed the lake every once in a while with bass, baby bass and catfish. They're starting to thrive. They're starting to get the point that, okay, these people want us in the lake because we're good. So they also, um, they overturned a few feet of the poison dirt some years ago um, so that the toxins would go down below, yeah, and hopefully. Yeah, when, when they did that, they kind of, they didn't, you know, it was all new. It was new science. They didn't quite know that when you're overturning all that dirt, a lot of the toxins went to the top. So when there's no farming, of course, you're attracting birds, and a lot of the birds got sick from these toxins. So they said, whoa, okay, just remember that, yeah. So they stopped that process and just basically carted away a lot of the dirt is what I'm hearing, just burned it off. It's a big job. And this is kind of fascinating. On the northwest shore, there's a marsh flowway where they pump the dirty water from the lake up a uh, sluice that's planted with like marsh grasses like that that suck out all the toxins and all the poisons from the water. Then they pump that water back down. It's a couple of miles long. They pump that water back down into the lake cleaner. And I'm told, I think it's about eight or nine times now, they filtered the entire bowl of water that is Lake Apopka. So now you can kayak, and I don't, I don't go on boats, small boats, but I had to give a tour with an Oakland group. Oakland, uh, uh, yeah, what is that um, the group called? Oakland Nature Preserve. They were like, Jim, you know the history of the lake. Why don't you come and help with this kayak tour? I said, sure. Wow. I'm in this little boat all by myself. Everybody else is experienced. They're a mile ahead of me, and I'm trying to keep up, telling them the history. But anyway, to experiment, I put my arm in the water a few times, and it's clear. You can see your arm. No gators. They're over there. The gators are over there on the shore. It's good. No gators. Yeah. I did come up with a bass every once in a while. No, no. But yeah, after about 40 years of these efforts, 40, 50 years, things are really, really, really starting to improve. That lake, you're on the surface of the lake, it doesn't smell like it did. It's bright. It's so bright and attractive in the sun that now it's, um, it's like a little mirror for all these birds flying down from New Jersey to South America for the winter. They're seeing Lake Apopka, the fourth largest lake in Florida. It's like a mirror now. It's clear. It's like a mirror. So these birds are saying, oh, we could rest. So they fly down to the shore. They stop, they relax, they roost. And apparently, when they do the Christmas Audubon co count every once in a while, Peggy, I think that's right, right? The Christmas Audubon count, we have more, bir more bird species on Lake Apopka than any other place in the southeast. Yeah, because, of, because it's so much cleaner. So we have, um, it's a draw now. And uh, as you know, they've built um, the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive along the North Shore. Who's done the wildlife drive? Good. When I asked this question a few years ago, it was like one hand. Good. 
So you'll see, especially in the gloaming, about five o'clock, six o'clock in autumn, you see all the animals going back home. At least that's what I think they're doing. I don't know. But that's when you see thousands of ducks and birds on the lakes. You see um, critters. I think that's what they call them. You'll see gators just all over the place. I mean, it's, it's healthier than it used to be. And it's, it's really such a fabulous place. And it's really good because you have to drive 10 miles an hour in one direction around the lake. Don't let any of the escalades push you out of the way. No, just 10 miles, one direction. You want to see birds? You're not going to race around the lake. It's really something. I'm glad so many people have done it. And that is, um, this is the old pump house. It's at um, one of the intersections where you can drive in two different directions, two different roads along the North Shore. They're one way. But that, we were privileged to be brought inside and shown the works. And it, it's, it's amazing. There's a hole in the roof where an owl goes in and out. And he roosts on top of that roof, broken section. And you can imagine in this giant building, down, right down below where he roosts, like they tell you, don't walk over there. Don't step over there. That's, that's the owl's work. But it's amazing. The thing works. And that's where they have this giant pool next to it with alum-treated water, which, which helps with the process of purifying. And alligators are attracted to that alum-tainted water. So you'll see that big pool next to the pump house, and there's hundreds of alligators. And once in a while, people in Orlando and Winter Park, they'll run a newspaper story saying, hundreds of alligators sighted in one place in Winter Garden. We're like, yeah, we know. We know. We, we know. They're always there. So the lake, the point is that um, it's getting better. And that's a lot of the routes around the lake that um, just um, show you where to walk and go. Things have been completed, I think, for the most part on the west side. You can now walk around the lake or bike almost 100%. It's about 42 miles. That's great. That's my bicycle. I didn't go too far, you know, just a photo op, you know. Make it look like it's in, in, the, in the distance. And I think that brings, okay, that, yeah, that, that brings us to the end of our sale. We have um, a lake that's being improved. We have a downtown that's being improved. We have this place. We have two museums. We have so much enterprise, so many people appreciating the area like yourselves. That's why we're all here. And when I talk about history, when I talk to um, the kids in school, you know, I'll, I'll mention all of this because they, they need to know the story. And I'll say to them, this, this is the story we're telling. And it's not just about a series of dates that you're experiencing that you have to memorize. It's, it's about people's lives and how they're inter interconnected generation to generation. And I had one little girl ask me once, well, how, what do you mean by that? It's not dates. And I said, get this, get my life. I said, I knew my grandmother who was born in 1899. That's the 19th century. I was born in 1955, the middle of the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century. And... Will, with whom I work, is probably, and, and Kate, they're going to live into the 22nd century. So my life experience of history touches on four centuries. Then they got it. They were like, oh, it's not just about dates. It's about the people you're related to and the town you live in. It's perfect. Second grader. And that brings me to, uh, yeah, so... You've got restaurants, you've got shops, you've got museums, you've got history, you've got great people who just banded together to do this, which is why we're all sitting here hearing this story. And I love it so much that I never tire of telling it. I'm going to have to make up some new jokes, though. That's, yeah, got to make a note. And I want to also, don't get upset, but um, this man has been so invaluable to my experience here at the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> Rod Reeves, the first director. I love, I love this man. Sometimes I'll pull out a family file and there'll be a sticker on it that says, not for public consumption. <laughs> well, one day. <laughs> Got to leave us open for more. So Rod was the first direct, uh, executive director of the Heritage Museum in those days, starting in 1998 when the museum opened. So he, he's like, he's in my heart keeping this place going. I love it so much. So. We want to thank you for all the years of support and friendship. We could not have done this without your help. And I haven't, hope I haven't gone on too long, but I did want to share our story. And it's not such a short story anymore. So thank you so much. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
There's still some refreshments available, and there are memberships available over there. We have our little credit card machine handy. So if you're not a member, let me promote this. If you become a member, you get a free copy of Changemakers, which talks about all the people who help settle and unsettle West Orange County. That's a premium. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Ah, thank you.